Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Turning Towards Life. This is Lizzie and the lovely Justin here on our weekly mission to bring sources to all of us for our learning and deepening and inspiration. And this week we have the magnificent Nick Cave as our source and something that he's written. And it's a true joy, Justin, that you've chosen Nick Cave. I'm so grateful. So thank you. Just to be upfront as well, we wanted to not forget to mention that Justin's going to be holding a Foundations for Coaching two days in September on the 23rd and 24th. This is 2019. You might be listening in 2040 or something, in which case it won't be happening. And we wanted to just extend that invitation to anybody who'd like to join Justin in this wonderful two days of deepening into what it might be to to work with people and and ourselves in this way that we call integral development coaching which is the kind of coaching that Justin and I do with people and we teach a year-long program as well and it's a great way of finding out more about it and having a, a kind of experience that gives you a flavor in 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 the body and in in our understanding of, of what this work can be so that's in London in Hammersmith on the 23rd and 24th September. Justin's going to be holding that. And if you're interested, you can go to our website, which is third space. We are thirdspace.org. Got that right for the first time. And you can find out more there. And also if you, if you want to message any of us on Facebook, you can as well. Is my hair in my mic or something, Justin? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so yes, we just wanted to mention that and, and invite you also to check out our, our lovely site as well, because I think most of the feedback we've got from it so far is that it's a place of beauty and inspiration and it's a very lovely place to go. And also just to say welcome to everybody who's here watching us live. We're so grateful that you're with us in this moment. It's wonderful. And we're also grateful to hear all the stories of people listening on podcasts or on YouTube. And it uh, continues to be a, a miracle to us that people listen and engage. And it's a complete joy to know that other people are in this conversation with us, which is basically the intention of this, is that Justin and I, we get to speak to one another openly and honestly in a true inquiry that's not planned other than the source. And also that people can join in with us because it feels like if we didn't do it with people, it wouldn't be as... Wouldn't be as sharing or community oriented which is one of our big intentions in the world so welcome to everybody in whatever state you find yourself in today and welcome to this nick cave piece which i think can lead us into some wonderful inquiries together thank you lizzie good morning to you good morning to everyone um i should say for those of you who are listening later you can't see lizzie as often because we try and do this Wherever we are, Lizzie is outside, and so the the wind gusts of wind you can hear occasionally is because we don't do this from a studio somewhere. We do this from wherever we are. I'll let you know, Lizzie, if it gets too much. It's mostly fine. I'm I'm really pleased to be here. It it is quite a miracle, Lizzie, that we get to do this, but also that other people are part of this too. And um, during the week, I bumped into someone who I know. Uh, I was doing some work quite far away from home. Um, and right where I was, there was someone that I know and uh, who I hadn't seen for a very long time. And I said to him how wonderful it was to see him. And he said to me, well, I see you every week. And I know that that's true of lots of people, is that um, as well as our dedication to show up every week, many of you show up every week too. So thank you. And if you are in our Facebook group, I really want to encourage you to say hello in the comments um, that the place that you can comment underneath every one of these um, live streams. Um, you could just say hello because it's wonderful to know that you're there. Of course, very often people say much more than that and we get into a very interesting conversation and you're really welcome to do that. And um, our source this week is from Nick Cave. So I have fallen in love with the work of Nick Cave over recent years. His music first, but he's been doing this very extraordinary project that in some ways in many ways is very much in tune with what we've been trying to do as well, Lizzie, which is to speak straightforwardly and, and in an unfiltered way about the things that he really cares about. And of course he has um, 
a way large number of people know about his work in the world than know about our work, which means that he has people write to him and then he responds. And this source, which you can always find if you're looking for the sources, you can always find them on turning towards dot life uh, on the web or, and on our Facebook group is from his project called the red hand files where people um, write a question and Nick responds. You can go and see the whole response to this question. I've just chosen one part of it. Um, and I'm going to read it first. So the original question was from someone called Gianelli, who was writing from Croatia, and this is what Nick Cave says in response. Is this world cruel? I don't think so. I think this world is indifferent, and indifference is not cruelty. What connects me to you, Gianelli, and you to every other sentient being in the universe is that the universe simply does not care about us. It does not act with malice or desire to harm us. It is simply unaffected by our condition. If one acknowledges this state of affairs, then it sets up a situation that allows us to make a simple choice. Either we respond to the indifference of the universe with self-pity and narcissism, as if the world has in some way personally betrayed us, and live our lives in a cynical, pessimistic and self-serving manner, or we stand tall, set our eyes clearly upon this unfeeling universe and love it all the same, even though, or especially because, it doesn't love us. This act of cosmic defiance, of, of subversive optimism, of unconditional and insubordinate love, is the greatest act of human beauty we can perform. To stand before this great, blank, heartless cosmic event and say, we believe in you, we love you, we care for you. This is the definition of Grace Gianelli and this is the epiphany you speak of. We create our own divinity, our own godliness through our ferocious need. We yearn the heavens awake. And if we are quiet, in prayer or in meditation, sometimes we can feel the heavens stirring, breathing our fragile and reckless love back through us. That's so beautiful, Dustin. I'm just gonna read the second half again for us. This act of cosmic defiance, of subversive optimism, of unconditional and insubordinate love, is the greatest act of human beauty we can perform. To stand before this great, blank, heartless cosmic event and say, we believe in you, we love you, we care for you. This is the definition of grace, Gianelli. And this is the epiphany you speak of. We create our own divinity, our own godliness through our ferocious need. We yearn the heavens awake. And if we are quiet in prayer or in meditation, sometimes we can feel the heavens stirring, breathing our fragile and reckless love back through us. This was a great move, Lizzie, to, for you to hold your microphone closer to you. It makes it so much easier with the wind to hear great. you. Thank you. Oh, it's so moving reading Nick Cave's words. And... Um, right now as you were reading Lizzie I was felt so touched by the this last part that you read if we are quiet if we're prepared to um, take part in this what he calls this great act of subversive optimism of unconditional and insubordinate love sometimes when we're very quiet and yearning just sometimes we feel the universe breathing our reckless love back through us. And I, I, um, I notice how much I long for it. And I also notice that it happens, but not on my command. As you say that, Dustin, I can feel the words arising in me that orient around 
what it means to receive and what it means to allow and what it means to surrender. Mm. And he said, it's not on my command. And there's something about the invitation that he makes around, you know, when we're quiet or in meditation or something. And actually, I think in lots of other situations too, this kind of state of letting go of the command of things like letting go of the notion that, that I can make something happen or I can have something happen because of something I do, but a, a, di a different realm of, of humanness, which is how can I be in a state of receptivity that allows this reckless love back through me again? A, 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 a reciprocity gets evoked in me that if I if I can powerfully love that which doesn't love me in my perception, what might, what might happen? And it feels like this kind of grand experiment that Nick's speaking of. That even when we don't seem to be receiving anything from the world, the act of defiance is to give or to connect with. And in that connection, the flow begins. Like it, it starts here, not there. And I really feel that in this last beautiful kind of poetic invitation about feeling the heavens stirring and breathing our fragile and reckless love back through us. It's like, I don't know, like the power, the power of poetry sometimes is so, so opening and so validating. And I too notice that that's possible. Even in this moment, I notice that that's possible. And in a way, it's occurring to me that doing this is a kind of, you know, you and I are talking to one another, which is a great comfort to be in conversation with a human being. But it also has the quality of us speaking into a space that we don't know, actually. We're speaking into the public. We're speaking into the world, which is God knows made of what. And sometimes I feel like this act of faith of us doing this together is this also an act of of loving of of stepping into some kind of unknown each time and then all the ways that you and i i know have received from this practice which who, who knew and who knows it just feels like participating and bringing ourselves forth in spite of what might or might not be there in return has this kind of great reciprocity inbuilt in it. Mm. As, um, as you're speaking, there's something I'm really trying to reach for that feels very important and feels a little bit tricky to, to put in words, but I'm going, I'm going to do my best, which is it starts in the earlier part of what Nick Cave writes here that, that um, I read that you didn't read the second time, which is once once we get into a story that the nature of existence itself is a kind of cruelty and we demand that that it not be the case. So this sort of twin step of um, life and the universe is inherently cruel. And I demand, because that's so unfair, I demand that it not be cruel. The demand that we make, like the sort of, um, prove to me that it's not the case and only then will I show up in life with love uh, is, is such a big trap. And, and um, Nick Cave says it really clearly here where he says um, the consequence of it is, is that we end up living our lives in a cynical, pessimistic and self-serving manner. It's like, um, I'm so desperate. I mean, it's such a natural, ordinary longing to not suffer and to not have the people that we love suffer. And we see this, we see suffering around us and we feel suffering in us and we demand that the universe somehow sort it out for us. And that, it seems to me, is, as we're talking about it, this is the, the central point because then we end up in a very childlike position, the sort of with, with existence as a parent who has to take care of us and us as a tiny child raging and... So what I can hear in what you're, the way you're saying it, Lizzie, is that when we go the other way, when we say, 
I'm not going to come at existence with prejudgment in that way. Existence is existence. Look, here we are. Actually, brackets, I think, oh my goodness, look, here we are. This tiny brief life of ours, we get to live, which itself is a extraordinary gift that we didn't ask for. But I'll put that in brackets for the moment. Look, here we are, I have a choice about whether to turn towards existence with fierce love or with cynicism and rage. And when we let go of our rage and cynicism and turn towards existence in as loving a way as we can, which as Nick Cave says is a radical subversive act in and of itself. Um, I think two things happen. So one is I think it changes us. So there's always this question of what kind of person do I get to be by being in the world one way or another, however the universe is, you know, and in a way, how can we ever know what's true about the universe as a whole? It's impossible to know. So first of all, it changes me. But the second thing is, as you're saying, is it also happens that when we pour ourselves into our existence with as much um, fierce love towards everything that we can, um, that very often the universe opens in response. And then, but the other thing that we have to do, it seems to me, is um, not come into our lives with a demand that anything will open in response, because that's the same, that's the same problem, which is when I'm trying to force everything to go a particular way, I'll, I'll love only so that I can feel wonderful, or so I can feel happy, or so I can feel full, or, or so I can feel fulfilled. No, we can't do it that way. We have to go we love, I love, simply because I'm prepared to love and I will live with the consequences, whatever the consequences might be. And it's only when we let go that, that the possibility that anything will open opens at all. It's really tricky to talk about because it's so easy to get in this sort of grasping position of um, clinging on to things being a particular way. And like you said right at the start, actually what's called for here is a giant um, releasing of having anything apart from our own intention be a particular way. So the one place that we can take responsibility for is how will I come at this? And then we have to let everything else do what it's going to do. Yeah, that's very beautifully said, Justin. I feel that. And it, and it, and it, and it arises for me that, you know, all the ways I fail at this, <laughs> you know, all the ways that I... I find myself loving conditionally or doing something because I want something back and how it's so, it's so easy and human to trip up on our own wishes because I think everything starts with a good intention. You know, like I make a meal with good and loving intention and then, and then someone says, Oh, well, it doesn't have enough salt in it or something. And you go, Oh, I've just realized that I needed you to say that was delicious in order for it to be okay that I did this. I mean, this is a small example, but if I extrapolate that into relationship and into marriage and into, you know, what it's like to, to be with the children in my family and what it's like, you know, it, it's just, you can, I can feel the, and what it's like to do work with people. It's, I have to, I have to, I have to know that about myself, that that's the way I trip up in order to regulate myself. Like it needs to be part of my consciousness that I see that in myself. I have to recognize that in myself in order to find a way of working with it, that it doesn't become the thing I communicate all the time, which mm -hmm. is my, my conditionality. Because I know that's not my intention, but I do know that I get triggered into, well, if I do this, then that should be coming back to me. And it's a really tricky one. It's such a human thing to want reciprocity and to feel the beauty of reciprocity. And many times that doesn't happen in human relationships and in our interactions with the universe, as, as Nick calls it. And for me, it's like an, uh, like an identity question as well. And the deeper that I inquire into, you know, what is this life? What is life itself? Who, who am I? the the more I get to let go of the grasping parts of me without thinking that I'm going to disappear if I don't get what I want, but that I can find something deeper 
than wants and my preferences for how things should be coming back to me the more I can let go of that the more I can let go of the grasping part that then allows a thing that probably gets to come more naturally because I'm not grasping for it it's the grasping itself that that is the stopper it's the it's the conditionality itself that stops the flow somehow I think we have to um distinguish it seems to me between yearning and grasping because one one way that uh, I think it's very tempting for us to go as well if me longing for things longing for anything can't be guaranteed if I long for your love for example or I long for that you'll say that you liked what I cooked or I long for my health or I'll long for you know any of the things that we can long for once we get that our grasping our demand that that other people or the universe respond in a particular way gets us into so much trouble into so much cynicism and rage and all of those things one other way that we can go is to say well i won't want anything anymore i won't i won't long i'll cut myself off from my very humanity which is to feel our longing for what's not here and what could be resolved i mean it's a it's a very straightforward and i think it's tricky because that very um sort of what's the word uh unsubtle move of cutting trying to cut us off from everything that we feel in order that we then won't feel our sadness and suffering and disappointment it ends up cutting off so much of what it is to be human which is why i love what nick writes where he says we yearn the heavens awake our longing for all of this is a great can be a great source of our love and our commitment and our presence so can we find a way of honoring and feeling that which we really yearn for and at the same time not clinging to um, anything or anyone having to respond to us in a very particular way? And I think that takes an awful lot of um, kindness and practice and tripping up and you know, goodness, if I think, Lizzie, of all the times I've said to somebody who I really love, I love you, mostly because I wanted to hear them say, oh, I love you back. And the love itself, the, the seed of it, is extraordinarily life-giving and human. It's one of the ways that, that life and the universe takes on meaning is that we can love. And I can also feel in myself the moment that I say it to get something back, I'm engaged in a wrangle. I'm already disappointed because you didn't say it the way I wanted you to say it and you didn't say it quickly enough and you didn't sound like you meant it enough when you said it. And now what am I meant to do? Because I, you know, it, it's, you see where all of this goes. And it is, it has been my experience that to say to someone else or to say to life, I love you and to really mean it and to know that it's true that I want to be loved back, but to not demand it, but to simply love regardless is a totally different place to stand and it is the place in which um we get to let go of the story that everything and everyone is betraying us all the time and i think that's the thing that i'm grasping for that nick cave says so beautifully is this this sense that i'm always on the edge of being personally betrayed and i need constant reassurance that i'm not that's the move that we have to let go of in order to feel the possibility of what Nick is inviting us into, which is that life breathes our fragile and reckless love back through us without our even asking. So lovely, Justin, your words are so lovely. And I can, as you're speaking them, inherent in what you're saying feels like a great, great vulnerability. I can feel in myself this part of humanness that is to say i want something or i yearn for something similar to as you say in, in the definition of that that you've just been speaking about there's no demand inherent in a yearning which is different to a grasping and it's such a fine line and the the vulnerability in wanting and reclaiming our wanting reclaiming our yearning and our what does he call it? Ferocious need. Mm. It's like we 
we have to let go of the outcome but in 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 yearning inherent in the yearning and and the letting go is a deep vulnerability like you say like loving someone and declaring something that you know that you love someone or in relationship feeling needy and vulnerable to the point where you might bear your soul before someone else has bared their soul at the risk of people walking away and and then you're left with the thing you declared without it being reciprocated it's such a vulnerable place and to be willing to go there we have to have that willingness to be vulnerable and it's so so hard to do that and yet it it as you said has the greatest um chance of coming back which is this kind of weird paradoxical thing going on that the harder i try the less likely it is to happen and I can feel real compassion for all of us in the yearning and the wishing and the wanting, the, the really human thing that creates so much as well. It's so creative to want and to wish and to hope for repair or the things that you wish for in life for yourself and other people. And for there to be a simultaneous allowing of whatever happens to happen is such a vulnerable place for a human who wants to fix things down and control them and mm. make sure it's all okay. That also comes from a place of love for self and others. And I just feel very, um, yeah, attuned to that vulnerability of, of each of us having desires. And the nature of human relationship is that you can't control the response of another and so it leaves you in this kind of unfixed down undefined realm of pure desire of pure wishing and yearning and i just appreciate that that's such a delicate and beautiful part of the human condition that we're all in and that, and i know it for myself like daring even i i found myself using the language like you know i've dared to want something is it going to be okay that I want that? Like, is it going to be okay? Am I going to, you know, is this one, is this wish, is this desire going to um, be the end of me? It's really vulnerable. And I really appreciate the way that you've said that and how it's kind of brought that forth in this inquiry, because to do what Nick's asking us or inviting us into requires a great kind of vulnerability, human vulnerability, that that doesn't rely on exchange it doesn't rely on getting something back to do something to, to have a certain attitude and it feels like a, a, a defiant thing and also a, um, a growing up thing like you said about the parent-child relationship as if the universe is our parent and we have all this expectation on it at some point it's got to turn it around and, and, you know, this speaks to me of the kind of environmental situation we're in at the moment as well. It's, it's up to us to take care of rather than the universe to just keep giving and giving and giving. And we just take, take, take. And it just feels this, this switch around ha is nigh in, in our development, in our relationship to the earth, in our relationship to one another, in our relationship to our whole lives, really. It's very beautiful and moved hearing all that you've said, Lizzie, and it, it's striking me as you're talking that right at the heart of this, you, you said a number of times, um, making ourselves vulnerable, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. And what I thought was actually, yeah, well, yes, there is a move that we can make to allow ourselves to feel our own vulnerability. And the deeper truth of it is, is that to be alive is to be vulnerable all the time we're already vulnerable and it's our it's our denial of our vulnerability and our rage and disappointment that we're vulnerable i think that gets us into the fix that nick is talking about in the first place where we say the universe is cruel because we know we see people around us getting ill and dying and we know that the same will happen to us and to everyone and everything and we take that to be the the great injustice when actually it's um an inevitable and unalterable consequence of being a living something. 
we're already vulnerable anyway. And part of the path that we're wondering, I think about together is here is how do we know our own vulnerability and not either give up on our lives and just say, well, it's all meaningless and nothing can happen. Or at the same time, um, demand, demand, demand that the universe gives us the safety that we want and live right in the truth of our own vulnerability in the middle of things. I think you're still muted, Lizzie. I didn't hear that last bit that you said because you froze in a very entertaining position on my screen. <laughs> and you froze here. I was just saying, I'll say this probably on the on the live stream and on the recording, people will have been able to hear what I said, but I'll say it, of course, so that you can hear it. I was saying that what's called for is our waking up to our inevitable vulnerability without either giving up on life because it's all impossible or childlike demanding that the vulnerability go away. And then we can, I think, do what you're saying, which is to be truthful about the fragility of everything. Yeah. And still yearn and love and wish and want mm -hmm. and know that there are no guarantees and still love in the midst of it. That's the radical act. Yeah. yeah. And that changes who we are. And it also changes who we can be for others, which is, I think, is the, the other central point here, which is that Nick Cave points out that the alternative is that we live in a self-serving way. And I know that that's um, a central theme for us in this conversation, Lizzie, is how do we bring ourselves to one another? And I, I'm so glad that Nick Cave has given us another way of talking about this. Me too. I really... I really, really appreciate this conversation. I think it's a, a never ending one about how to be, how to be in the world. And, yeah. and there's, you know, the perils of all the paths are present and yet the one that has love most inherent in it and, and active loving is, feels the most compelling and the most rich and the most holding and my sister was talking to me the other day about this quote that's i don't even know who said it and um it's i think it's a goethe thing but i don't know um which is to love and not to be loving is not to love there's something in the in the acting in the participation in life that qualifies things as the as themselves and I feel like this is a grand invitation to, to be fully in, to, to participate in the loving, to participate in the activity of these words yes. and to be acting from that place and performing acts of those kind from the place that we reach in our meditations or that we yearn for. And I can feel the, the growing upness of that as well is that there has to be action in all of this too. And it's not just a contemplation, but it's actually, you know, what to, how, how are we impacting ourselves and other people around us and the world? And, and allowing that this stirring heaven breathes back through us feels to me an invitation to, to act and do things and make things and contribute practically to life. I'm going to weave together a couple of things just by way of closing a couple of things that we've been talking about in recent weeks with what you've just said, Lizzie, which is that the point of love talked about this way is to love. The point of love is loving. It's not, it's not to get something. It's loving for the sake of loving itself. So that's the first part. And the second part is also what you just said, which is, and that of course always means taking action as we've said before, that love isn't a feeling as much as it is a way of bringing ourselves to the world. And then we can end with this last part of the first paragraph of this um, source. And then we can stand tall, set our eyes clearly, upon this unfeeling universe and love it all the same, even though, or especially because 
He doesn't love us. So whether, whether we are loved back or not is far from the point. And that's the great gift that human beings have, is that we can choose the way in which we bring ourselves into whatever situation we're in. It's the one thing that we have every time we have agency over is how will I, with what intent and with what orientation will I bring myself into this very situation? It turns out that everything flows from there. I think it turns out that our whole existence flows from there. And of course, the existence of the others who come into our orbit as well. So I'm so glad for this conversation and it's, um, it's time that we ended, although I know we could go on. And I want to say thank you to everyone for being with us and that we will be back 9 a.m. UK time uh, next Sunday morning live on Facebook and then on our podcast afterwards and on YouTube for All the Nines, week 99 of this project next week. (laughs) Great. Thank you, everybody, for being with us and this gorgeous conversation, Justin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.